This video is going to help you get to know the changes to the student growth rubrics for 3.1, 6.1, and 8.1 as part of our teacher evaluation. My name is Mark Gardner, and I'm a practicing English teacher at Hayes Freedom High School in the Camas School District, I'm a member of the Camas Education Association, and I also work with OSPI as co-lead for the Marzano T Prep framework statewide. This video is going to help you understand what the changes are, why the changes are happening right now of all times, and also what are some ways that we might implement this, not just in the classroom, but in our relationship with evalu between evaluators and teachers. So let's get started by looking at the big picture as a quick review. We know that over the last 10 years or so, we have all been evaluated on student growth goal setting and outputs for individuals or small groups, whole classes or cohorts, and also uh, collaborating with others in a PLC or team to create or monitor student growth goals. These have been referred to as the ends or the inputs because these are the things that we do as professionals to establish our focus with our practice. The video that you're watching right now is focusing on the revisions to the rubrics related to these three elements of our instructional frameworks. And this doesn't, this transcends everybody's instructional framework, whether you're Marzano like me or Cell or uh, Danielson, whatever your district might use. This is common language statewide. There's another video that focuses on the outputs, which is the, uh, the point twos, so to speak, of student growth, where we look at the outputs of the goals and what we do um, with kids. And there's a separate video that you'll be able to link to, to take a look at detail on that. To help us understand the goal setting revisions, we're gonna focus in on student growth 6.1, which is the whole class or whole cohort goal setting. Let's begin by taking a look at what the changes are. Starting with the uh, student growth goal, rub goal rubrics that were established long ago or uh, for student growth 6.1 whole class goals let's focus in on the language of proficient for the, for the uh, previous version and we're also going to do the same for the new version focusing in on the language of proficient for whole class student growth goals so let's take a look at what the changes are in the original student growth goal rubrics it starts off with establishing appropriate student growth goals for a whole classroom and then the, the goals identify multiple high quality sources of data to monitor, adjust, and evaluate the achievement of those goals. That second part has actually been relocated to be emphasized in the point twos because the, the, the point two rubric, 6.2, 3.2, are really about the outputs and the outcomes. So the revised goal setting rubrics really focus on that first part. What does it mean to establish appropriate student growth goals for a whole classroom? A proficient student growth goal will demonstrate our clear and thorough understanding of the who, the what, and the how. This breaks down what it means to have an appropriate student growth goal for the whole classroom. The who, obviously, if we're going to be working with students, we need to know about our students. So a quality growth goal is going to enable us to explain how our knowledge of the students, including their cultural, academic, and social emotional assets, helped us determine that this was the appropriate goal for this set of learners. Then we get to the what, are we addressing a critical standard for our, the, the content and grade level? And then the how, I'll get into in a little bit more detail in a moment, might include some language that's new to people, which refers to cognitive and emotional engagement. So you might be able to see on the screen, depending on how good your resolution is, that there's a few terms that are bold face, critical standard and cognitive and emotional engagement. As part of the rollout of these rubrics, OSPI included a document that kind of identifies what some of these important terms mean. Critical standard is one of them. A critical standard is identified as part of a state or national learning standard or something that is a significant learning that gives the kids an opportunity to advance complex thinking. But it could also include other learning supportive standards like the 21st century CTE learning skills or habits of mind, standards of mathematical practice, things like that. So it isn't limited only to the specific discrete content standards. If there's something that you're monitoring that supports student growth, that can be part of how you define the critical standard. The, under the how, the cognitive and emotional engagement might be new to some people. Cognitive engagement breaks down the fact that a quality goal is going to require students to draw upon previous experience to make sense and meaning from their new learning, but that it's also complex and higher order thinking, demands complex and higher order thinking from kids that fosters that cognitive engagement. The emotional engagement goes back to what research has said again and again, that when students are emotionally engaged and interested, the learning is more likely to happen. So a proficient goal is gonna take that into consideration as well. How does the goal reflect student interest um, and sense of belonging, active learning? Does it empower them for their ownership of their learning? And does it make space for their own voice and reflection um, 
to really develop their self-driven effort, persistence, and concentration. Um, and that's something that is a kind of a new layer, but an important layer that actually also shows up in other elements of our instructional framework as well. So we've looked briefly at the 6.1 whole group rubrics. It's important to recognize that that kind of forms a template for the other parts. So if we look at the 3.1 goal setting, you'll notice that most of the language is verbatim the same. The, dis the difference is that for 3.1, you're focusing on developing a growth goal for a student group that's not yet reaching full potential. And then the other piece that's included for 3.1 is that this, the teacher seeks and considers input from students' families in developing the goal. So because this is very much about individualized or small group goal setting, the, this particular rubric folds in that, that important layer of the, the, the team of adults that might be wrapping around a student. And that's the other layer that's unique for being proficient in 3.1 student growth goal setting. Similarly, 6.1 forms the essential framework for 8.1, which is collaboration around goal setting. So again, the, the essential bulk of the, the content is the same for the, the rubric descriptor. The teacher collaborates with other grade school or team members to develop the student growth goal is, is a layer that differentiates 8.1 from the whole group, uh, from the whole group goal setting. And then also this idea that if agreements are made as a proficient team member, you following through with the team instructions or team, team decisions regarding instruction, assessment, whatever. In many cases, this may mean that a PLC or team might have common goals that you are all working toward and monitoring together. But this little shift in 8.1 is particularly important for those of us like me, who may be the only person in your entire building that teaches your grade level and content. I'm the only sophomore and senior English teacher in my building, for example. So even though I might collaborate with the other English teacher who teaches ninth and 11th grade, or I might collaborate with the humanities teachers, we don't necessarily have to have the exact same goal. We can still support one another by, you know, examining the growth goals, what do we know about students, different assessment strategies and monitoring strategies. We can collaborate around that and not necessarily have to have the exact same goal. That is something that is very much situational. And so um, you, you might find that there are conditions where PLCs will want to have common goals, but there's also those unique situations where having a common you know, verbatim same goal just doesn't make sense. So that's a little bit about what the changes are, and that's definitely just the tops of the waves. There's certainly opportunities to go into further depth and in thinking about those, which leads us to the obvious question of why now? With all the things that our schools are going through, our society is going through, our students are going through, why right now the, the time to change our student growth rubrics? And so when we think about it, the current student growth rubrics have been around for about 10 years, which means over the course of that 10 years, we've learned a lot about what student growth can look like, what student growth should look like, and what it ends up actually looking like when put into practice. And because of that, this is an opportunity for us to really refocus because the whole purpose of our public school institutions is to help students grow their knowledge and skills toward whatever their future might hold for them. This chance right now, where we are refocusing so much of our systems and our instruction, um, this makes sense to make this small shift in terms of how we focus on what it means to really foster student growth. There's also this reality that um, as districts and the statewide, we look at the importance of equity in our systems, that every student deserves to grow. And including that language around the cognitive engagement and the emotional engagement, those are two research-based um, areas in which equitable practice can really be launched in terms of using student growth goals to accomplish authentic equity within the classroom. And so that's an opportunity that leadership at the state level and at the, at the frameworks levels, we have really examined that this is a place where we can insert that so that the student growth goals that we set in our classrooms help to foster system-wide equity in order to make a meaningful change for all of our students. So while the why now, there's always, I think of all the things that have come down the pike when, uh, as an educator, there's never a perfect time, but it makes sense to me right now that as we reconfigure and really think about how to shift our systems for the better service of our students, the why makes sense at this point for me. The how, that's a little bit more challenging. And so we can think about it kind of at the global level, the, the larger level. At the statewide level, the coming school year, 2021-22, Districts will have the opportunity to pilot, test out the conversations that come as the result of this language. Um, and there's really no requirement, of course, that, that 
districts engage depending on what's going on in your local context. At the local level, um, as, a, as a union representative, it's important that we um, consider MOUs or contract adjustment language that may need to happen in order to accommodate um, teachers or evaluators that may want to try out this language. And then when I think down at the level of my own classroom and the classrooms of my fellow educators, it's really helpful to keep in mind that as we do this work, part of the how is to think about the natural harvest of what it is that we already do. That phrase natural harvest, I remember picking up um, during a WEA training from Scott Poirier, that it's really about looking at what we already do in order to evaluate our practice and our student growth, as opposed to creating, you know, apple crates and binders full of artifacts and paperwork. So that priority of what are we already doing and how can we tweak what we're doing to better serve students? That's what the emphasis of the how to implement really should be focused on. So how do we implement this? You know, I think about myself as a classroom teacher, I'm going to be setting some whole class goals. Okay, got that on my plate. And then we've got small group goals and we've got the whole group goal or the collaboration goals. And then I start thinking about all these other things that are coming in, like PLC responsibilities and my professional growth goal, universal design, school improvement plan, equity initiatives. And I don't even know what TPS 4.0 stands for. Plus, there's all this language in my framework that I need to be considering. It can be obviously overwhelming. So back when we first started this rollout, when the law passed a dozen years ago, one of the ideas that really caught traction that I think some systems may have forgotten about is this idea of forging connections. So if I've got my student growth goal, how can I connect it to my small group goal and to my collaboration goal? And how can I connect it to other parts of my practice that just naturally make sense? So the analogy that sometimes comes up is the idea of the Tupperware drawer, right? We've got all these separate this can potentially disconnected things that we've got to do in our in our profession. Um, but if we can find a way to nest things together and make it more efficient, it'll be much more manageable and make much more sense. And so that idea of nesting is one that I know has been around for a long time. But I found even in my own support of new teachers and, and other uh, framework related stuff, people have kind of forgotten about this tool. And so what I'd encourage you to think about are a few questions, particularly those of you that are classroom teachers, about how you can make this more manageable if you decide to take on this new student growth language. And quite frankly, even if you don't decide to take on the new student growth language this year, this is just a good reminder of how to make this work a little bit more manageable. Since our focus really is about students' growth and development, if I'm beginning with a student growth goal, whole class goal, I might think, okay, how could I take the wording of that whole class role and refine it to meet the needs of my subgroup, whoever I identify once I get to know my students. I can also think how might my team or PLC help me refine and improve those student growth goals, because then I'm not only focused on hitting my whole class growth goals, I've addressed my small group whole growth goals, I'm using my team to support me. And I haven't written a bunch of goals. I'm still focusing on that one core group of, of kids and that one core content standard that I'm really focusing on. How might my student growth efforts help me examine my professional growth goals? We all have to do professional growth goals and think about our own growth and development as part of our, 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 our whole system. So if I determine that there's a certain practice I want to focus on developing and improving in my own practice, why not craft my student growth goals to help me examine my own growth as an, as, as an instructor. And so then again, by nesting those two concepts together, I'm not only examining my own growth and development, but I'm really looking at the impact that my, my personal improvement as a professional is having on my kids, which is the whole point of professional growth in the, in the big picture. We also have to remember that there's other aspects of our instructional frameworks that just have to happen if we're gonna be implementing instruction and assessment related to our goals. So my student growth goal doesn't happen in a vacuum separate from all the rest of my practice. When I'm implementing and instructing related to that goal, I'm hitting all the other parts of my instructional framework. So student growth goals, if really well nested with the rest of your focus around examining your practice and your evaluation, th that experience of the action research related to your student growth goals can really accomplish a tremendous examination on the part of, of your practice for your evaluation. And use your evaluator. How might your evaluator use your observation to help you gather info around monitoring progress towards your goals? So really thinking about how can we take these things that could very easily be completely separate parts of our practice and 
nest them together in a way that is meaningful and impactful and really streamlined so that we're focused on the ultimate goal, which is student growth and development. We've talked about what the changes were, why now, and what are some ideas about how we might implement these changes to our student growth evaluation. This video did just focus on the goal setting elements of the rubrics. There is that separate video that talks about the outputs, the point twos, and what that might look like in our practice. So if you have questions about that, take a look at the documents and, and maybe view that video as well. All of this information is housed on the OSPI website, and you'll notice down there in the bottom corner that there is contact information should you or your district have any questions about what this means and how to implement. So best of luck this school year. Continue doing the good work of promoting student growth for all of the students in the state of Washington.